had a bunch of Bitcoin in my yeah. funds when I mm. managed outside capital. You know, that's a, I don't know, a three or four billion dollar mistake in growing now because my partners at the time capitulated and I wanted to be a good team member and we distributed and it was profitable, but obviously I shouldn't have sold it. Bitcoin, the world's biggest cryptographic money by market cap, hit another record, breaking high of nine, three, four, seven, one much to the energy of financial backers and Conspicuous characters who had anticipated an extraordinary year for Bitcoin in 2024, tycoon financial speculator Shamath Palapa effectively beat this rundown as he had made a few bullish expectations for the main digital currency toward the start of the year. During one of the prior episodes of the All In webcast, Chath assessed that Bitcoin could arrive at more than $500,000 per coin by October 2025, which checks precisely year a half post having, as per the tycoon's examination, Bitcoin's value will in general stay in similar reach for around a half year after the halving occasion, then costs get strongly after the sixth month, lighting a monstrous bull run that frequently goes on for an additional a year by all signs. The continuous bull run is right on Shaft's plan, yet it is a mix second for the tycoon funding entrepreneur in the most recent episode of the All In Digital broadcast. Chath shares his fervor about the bull run, which he says is just barely starting. His lament about selling a piece of his Bitcoin property too soon, a choice he gauges has cost him about three to four billion. Do as such, Fartok's disappointment is additionally uplifted by the way that he had utilized the Bitcoin worth about $1.06 million at the time in 2014 to purchase a vacant parcel in Lake Tahoe when he gave an update about his misfortune point in February 2021. The $1.06 million in Bitcoin would have been worth almost $130 million today. It is worth billions of dollars. Unquestionably, the unfilled Lake Tahoe part is not even close to this valuation tech. Years after the fact, no matter what this exorbitant mix-up shath remains a significant Bitcoin bull, anticipating that the primary digital currency will experience significantly better days in the future. As is his natural inclination, there will be a time in our lives when Bitcoin will become a completely uncorrelated and free resource, as well as a non-speculative store of significant value. Shath accepts one Bitcoin, which will be worth a significant amount of money when the day arrives. We will be providing you with cuts from the digital broadcast. If it is not too much trouble, please like this video, subscribe to the feed, and enable post warnings for future recordings. Thank you for watching and participating in the video. It's going to still be pretty subdued. Subdued, okay. I don't, I don't think that you're going to see these crazy M&A deals that I think everybody is expecting. I also don't anticipate a lot of these big companies going public, at least in the first half of the year. And the only reason I say that is I just think that like this year and the first half of next year, what's the difference? The IPO market is what the IPO market is. And if the 10-year is back to, you know, four and a half, five percent, that's not a compelling strategy for some SaaS company or some internet business that didn't take an opportunity to go public when rates were at zero. So if you just look mathematically at what the actual fair value of these companies should be. I don't know. It's not like such a great IPO market. Then on the M and A side, if all you're doing is waiting for Lena Khan to not be there, to me, I think that that betrays what M and A is supposed to be, which is you're supposed to underwrite some industrial logic from first principles where things are very accretive, and very accretive things should not hang by a thread on the emotional regulation or dysregulation of the FTC commissioner. So I kind of think that you would have seen some of this stuff already as well if, if the industrial logic was so high. And again, when rates are non-trivially high, I just think that it's not the easiest thing in the world to pull off like a really big M&A event, nor is it a really easy thing to pull off to pull off a huge IPO. When yeah. Again, there's a reason why Warren Buffett has $325 billion sitting in T-bills 
making 4.5% a year. He owns more T-bills than the United States government. He's making about $15 billion a year in interest. When you can do that with absolutely no risk, again, relative to stocks at least, yeah. What is this IPO going to give you? Jamal's right. Like the, the tenure is at four and a half percent. You're basically paying 20 times cash flow to own a risk free bond, the US Treasury bond. Or you can pay 23 times to own it's a totally 30 risky times, asset. Yeah. It's 30 it's times to, to own the SP 500 right now. It's so, nuts. Yeah, it's but but there is a lot of risk seeking shifting happening, Chamath, right? So I mean we talked about like some of the crypto stuff, some of the fintech stuff, deregulation, that the PE might seem high today, but if you forecast out 10 years for some of these businesses in a deregulated, detaxed environment or reduced tax, reduced regulation environment, that the earnings should accelerate in a way that outpaces the, the multiple you're getting today, right? So, I mean, this is part of why some of the fintech companies are ripping right now, why some of the finance companies are ripping right now. If under Trump and the Republican control of the House and Senate, laws don't pass and regulations get reduced, theoretically, earnings are going to rip. And you should pay a higher multiple today because you're actually buying these things at eight to 10 times earnings five years from now. So there seems to be some risk appetite there. But I do agree with Chamath on the M&A point. If you think about what's gone on over the last but couple hold, of hold years, on, big- Hold on a second. Can I ask you a question? Do you think that yeah, regulation yeah. is the reason why these SaaS companies have never made a dollar of profit? <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about SaaS. I'm not talking about SaaS. I'm talking, okay, so I guess we should split. Then you're we talking should, about industrial companies? No, the fintech market, right? So we were talking about fintech and some of these assets earlier, some of these equities that have been very, ripping. It's a very narrow part of the economy, right? Like if you look at broad, like on a broad based basis, the tens and tens of trillions of dollars of market cap that exist, I do agree with you that deregulation benefits a bunch of those companies. But it benefits sort of the non-tech businesses more than the tech businesses. The tech That's businesses true. right now yeah. are relatively lightly regulated. Yeah, I would think that it benefits pharma businesses. It benefits ag businesses. It benefits real estate companies. It benefits a whole, a whole swath of the economy. But we've started to see that re-rating. And maybe we'll see a lot more. So maybe, Jason, the more nuanced answer to your question is the kind of M&A that I think you want to see. That I mean, let's face it, that we all want to see here because we all have a yeah. A vested interest, which is really specifically tech m and I don't think that any of this deregulation particularly accelerates that. But maybe a more nuanced take on this would be that these other more regulated parts of the economy could do well and catch up to some of the earnings potential or the forward pricing of the tech businesses. But again, now you get into this weird trade where you can buy steady cash flowing businesses that can grow in valuation as fast as a as a fast growing but money losing tech business mm -hmm. but then you trade both of those two things off and it has effectively the same yield as a 10 year David Friedberg an angel investor and businessman is convinced that the victory of president elect Donald Trump is a contributing factor to the increase in asset prices much like the shattered entrepreneur Market participants are of the opinion that Trump's policies will promote economic growth and stimulate investment in all sectors. Friedberg and ARK and Best founder Kathy Woods anticipate that Trump will implement additional deregulation, which will eliminate the red tape that has impeded economic growth and burdened Americans. They are of the opinion that these efforts will be beneficial for industries, such as the digital asset sector which has been under the scrutiny of regulatory agencies such as the Securities and Exchange Commission. Cryptocurrency investors are particularly enthusiastic about Trump's pledge to remove the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The industry is expected to experience further growth and development in and outside of the United States upon Gary Gensler's arrival in office. Additional excerpts from Shath Friedberg and David Sachs are attached. Bring up something maybe tangential and you can react to this. Just speaking of kind of like censorship and then just the, the media complex that we have. I saw today that Trump filed like a 10 or $15 billion lawsuit against the broadcast networks. And maybe this is old news, but I may, and maybe I just saw the news. I now, saw a headline go by on X. I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah, I, don't I saw it on what X it is. as well. Uh, yeah. Didn't make and then, and then yeah. separately with, Bobby Kennedy's nomination to HHS, one of the things that he has said that he wants to put an end to is the advertising that 
pharma does on these broadcast stations. If you put these two things together where you deprive these folks of their largest revenue source, and at the same time, they have to sort of like answer for censorship or manipulating content. It does. Do you think that that changes the landscape of how all these companies behave in the future? Or how do you think that that plays out? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, all right, let's take each one of those. So on the, the broadcasters, and we've talked about this before, the big broadcast networks and their affiliates receive free spectrum licenses from the FCC. And they get some of the most valuable spectrum there is through those licenses in exchange for certain requirements that their broadcasts are in the public interest. Namely, they have to follow a fairness doctrine, which is supposed to mean that you give equal time to both candidates. Well, in the final weeks of this campaign, we saw some really egregious abuses. NBC brought on Kamala Harris, but not Donald Trump for a very favorable segment on Saturday Night Live the week before the election. Separately, you saw 60 Minutes deceptively edit in an interview with Kamala Harris where they actually took one of her answers from one question and put it as the answer to another question. I mean, really deceptive. So you have a couple of examples with both CBS and NBC, which were violating the equal time requirement, were, were clearly working on behalf of the Kamala Harris campaign. And when you look at the coverage itself, this election was the most unequal in terms of favorable coverage. It was something like a 60-point difference. So, something like Kamala, Kamala Harris received 80-something percent favorable coverage, and Trump received something like 85 percent negative coverage. So it, there's no way— Who's that, that can, according to? Do you know? Yeah, there's a, it's a report by Brent Bazell's uh, media watchdog group. It's been around forever, and it's been recording this stuff in every election for the last 30 years. In any event— I think that there's a very strong argument that the broadcasters have not been fair. That's a violation of their license requirements, and we should be reevaluating their spectrum, especially because it's not the highest best use you know, of the spectrum anyway. The great irony of this, which we're already seeing, which is the consumers are moving away. We just talked about moving away from cable news, moving away from legacy media. They don't trust it. The trust is at an all time low. I don't know if it's necessarily the government's job to determine who advertises what, where, how, and why. I don't like the government having that sort of degree of authority, generally speaking, because it can then lead into the government having overreach and oversight to control entities that maybe are competitive with the government in different ways. I do believe that the, the beef with big tech is a result of big tech's influence over the population where big government wants to have that degree of influence over the population. So it's actually a battle between government and private entities over who can influence the population and who has the ability to control the narrative. And I think that the general concept that the government should be determining who advertises where, what, how, and why is not a great one. And I don't think that consumers are dumb. I think that consumers are showing their proclivity for independent media and independent news sources because they don't trust the influence that's been kind of Im imparted upon these other channels and these other sources, and they're moving away from it. So I don't know if it's as much kind of a regulatory question and big pharma needs to be affected. I, I think that the market to, to some degree does its job. I don't think the consumers are dumb. I will also just kind of counter one of Sachs's points. I, I think that there are drugs, like multiple sclerosis is a good example. There was a drug introduced a couple years ago called Ocrevus, and it was a new therapy for, for multiple sclerosis that is extremely effective. It, it's, a, it's a really a big step change in, in biological therapies. In other news, Bitcoin investors are celebrating the approval of spot Bitcoin ETF options. Michael Saylor, the executive chairman of MicroStrategy, has stated that we will accelerate institutional Bitcoin adoption and cause Bitcoin prices to skyrocket significantly on November 16th. Eric Balunis, a Bloomberg ETF analyst, announced that the CFTCC had cleared the way for spot Bitcoin ETF options to be listed. He noted that the commission's approval was the second hurdle that needed to be cleared after the SEC's approval in September. The third hurdle approval from the OCC has now been issued, and Balunis believes that the options could start trading as early as Tuesday. Announcement from the OCC is as follows. On September 20, 2024, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission approved the listing and trading of options on iShares Bitcoin Trust. On November 15, 2024, 
the CFTC Division of Clearing and Risk issued a staff advisory regarding the clearing of options on spot commodity exchange-traded funds. In accordance with this advisory, EOCC is preparing for the clearance, settlement, and risk management of these options, which are subject to the new option listing process as established in the Options Listing Procedure Plan. Our objective at NASDAQ is to list and trade these options as soon as tomorrow. Allison Hennessy, the director of ETP listings at NASDAQ, disclosed on Bloomberg's ETF IQ on Monday that options trading for spot Bitcoin ETFs would commence on November 19th. However, she did not provide confirmation. Although the approval was specifically for IBIT, Hennessy observed that the listing process typically proceeds rapidly after the OCC approval is obtained, often within a matter of days. James Cart, an analyst at Bloomberg, ETFs indicated that other Bitcoin ETFs may also introduce options trading this week. The approval of options for spot Bitcoin ETFs has been described by Jeffrey Park, the head of Alpha Strategies at Bitwise, as the most extraordinary upside volatility of volatility in financial history. Park emphasized that trading Bitcoin ETF options under the regulation of the OCC significantly enhances Bitcoin's financial utility by opening up new possibilities for leverage and sophisticated investment strategies. He further elaborated that Bitcoin's distinctive attributes, including its inherently volatile nature and fixed supply, render it well-suited for significant growth in this newly regulated market. In summary, Part concluded with a severe observation regarding the Bitcoin ETF options. The market is the first instance in which the financial world will witness regulated leverage on a perpetual commodity that is truly supply-constrained. In such circumstances, it is likely that things will get wild. Please share your thoughts on the video in the comments section below. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications to remain informed about future content. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.